Welcome back to another episode of Sharing Knowledge Series. I'm Kevin Vondro, Chief Lending Officer at Westfield Bank and your host. Our topic today focuses on workplace culture and employee development. We'll be discussing the connection between engaged and empowered employees and the impact that has on workplace culture. Please join us for this episode. Welcome back to another episode of Sharing Knowledge. My name is Kevin Vondero, your host. And today's topic is going to be, we're going to focus on workplace culture and employee development. Now we have special guests with us here today, and I'd like to introduce, we have Mike Milby, CEO, and Beth Sweeney, president of Ratliff Taylor. And then with us is also is Mike Toth, CEO and president of Westfield Bank. Beth and Mike, why don't you talk to us a little bit about Ratliff and Taylor and really what your role is and, and what, what Rat, Ratliff and Taylor does. Sure, well, I'm Beth Sweeney and I serve as the president of Ratliff and Taylor and we are a talent management consultancy. So we help organizations find, develop, and then transition um, their employees. And we like to say that we make people's personal lives better by making their professional lives better. So I oversee the three lines of business um, and uh, we have a team of about 30. Okay, great, thank you. And Mike? I'm Mike Milby, I'm the CEO at Ratliff and & Taylor, and uh, Beth and I are the uh, owner-operators of the organization, so we're uh, very much involved in both the strategy of the organization and also the, um, you know, the, work, that, the work that we do. I have um, about four decades of experience in human resources and talent management. Half of that was spent in a Fortune 500 company, and then the other half has been spent the last 20 years with Ratliff & Taylor. Good. We look forward to you sharing some of that knowledge with us here today. And Mike, uh, you are newly appointed CEO at Westfield Bank. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, about yourself and, and what you do at Westfield? Sure. Uh, again, my name is Mike Toth. I'm the president and CEO of Westfield Bank. I don't have four decades <laughs> of banking experience, but three decades of banking experience and uh, proud to be a part of Westfield Bank. We're now uh, one of the largest community banks in the state of Ohio with just over $2 billion in assets. Okay, great. Thank you. So today we're going to be talking about culture, and it sounds like we have a lot of experience in, in the room. But what is culture when we think of culture? Mike or Beth? It's kind of like the million-dollar question. Yeah. We get asked it a lot, and we ask it a lot of other people, and it's, um, I think defining culture is a little squishy. Um, people will often say it's a friendly culture or family culture, but... Um, when you break it down for us, it's really about connecting your values, um, your belief system to your behaviors. So what are those things that drive how you treat people, how you treat customers, how you conduct your business? Yeah, when, when we're talking with uh, clients, rather than trying to explain it, uh, we really sit down and say, if we can understand how decisions get made in your organization, and if we can understand how work gets done, then we can begin to to articulate what your culture really is. Yeah, and, and I think it's important. Culture isn't the same for every business. I, I think each business has to identify what their culture is and, and, and build upon it. And within a company, there's subcultures and departmental cultures and location cultures. It's complex. Mike, is there anything you wanted to add or, around I think those culture? are great answers. I guess uh, when I think about culture, I just think about the personality of the organization. And to me, the culture is really what helps build the bridge between the mission of the organization and how the teams execute on the mission. Good. So we've got a, a lot of good definitions on culture, but why is culture so important? Um, Mike, you, you wanna take that one? Sure, um, so I think culture is important to an organization because it helps set the stage for how a company attracts employees to the organization but also how it keeps employees in the organization. And frankly, a good culture can be a, a, an extreme differentiator for a company, especially in a company where you might provide or sell a commodity product like banking. No. You know, they, they always say um, an employee doesn't leave at their job. They leave their, their leader or their manager, and that's all part of that culture, and that's why, why it's important. What, what about you, Mike? Well, I... Uh, I would say, um, you know, imagine, imagine two rowboats on a lake and six people in each rowboat. And in one rowboat, three of the people are paddling in one direction and three are paddling in the other direction. 
And then in the second rowboat, all six people are paddling in the same direction. Um, that's really what culture can do for you. It's, it, it's, a, it's reflective of the importance of it because if you have alignment uh, among all your employees as to what's important to the organization and the way you want people to operate and behave, then you get consistency uh, in the way you move forward. No, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a great explanation. Beth, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think too just engagement is really focused on or centered on culture. And, you know, I'm, I'm more engaged if I feel aligned, I feel like we're all rowing in the same direction, mm -hmm. um, feel like we are driven by the same uh, value system, belief system. And, um, you know, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put more into my, my everyday work because I really feel a part of it. So I think it's huge when it comes to engagement. No, I agree. It, in, in productivity. So here's the million dollar question. So we know culture is important. So who owns the culture in an organization? Who, who, who's responsible for that? Is it at the leadership level or is it at the employee level? Mike and I had a conversation about that the other day. <laughs> and I, you know, I think it varies depending on who you're talking to and um, the subject. But um, from my perspective, I think the CEO really owns the culture. Uh, and the employees of that organization reflect the culture. Um, the difference, however, is if the CEO or the leader of an organization is not being intentional about defining and living the culture, then the employees do kind of take ownership of it because they do their best to understand and appreciate what it is that they think you want them and to do and how you want, how they, you know, how you want them to behave and they act accordingly. Would you agree to that, Mike? I agree. I, you know, I think the CEO has a, an accountability to uh, create the view of what the culture looks like and to provide the resources to help enable the culture. But at the same time, I would say that a culture doesn't exist without employees. And employees have to want to be a part of the culture and in some cases really shape what that culture looks like. So while I agree with Mike that the CEO is ultimately accountable for that culture, I also subscribe to the uh, philosophy that a culture doesn't exist without, without the employees. Thank you. Beth, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, um, you, know, you use the word intentional, which we mm -hmm. use a lot in our work. And um, you know, I think the language that a CEO or a president or a leader um, uses um, really shapes the culture. Um, so if you think about maybe a leader saying something like, you know, the customer is always right versus we're all in this together. You know, that just those words that that leader chooses um, really can shape the culture. And it, and it's, it, it very quietly you know, directs employees um, as to how they should behave or how they're expected to behave. So um, I think intent is um, a really big piece of that. Yeah. Well, no, culture is important. Uh, it helps productivity, um, really keeps your employees engaged. And I think, Mike, you mentioned it could be a, a differentiator in attracting talent is, is really the culture uh, attracts people coming to that organization. So what if you have to change the culture? I mean, how do you go about doing something like that if there needs to be a change in culture? You know, if, if, there's, you know, if there's a change uh, that needs to take place, then there needs to be an appreciation on the part of the leader as to, you know, what those changes are and why the change needs to take place. I think there also has to be um, a bit of a, an evaluation as to whether the cultural change that you think you need still is aligned with the core values of your organization uh, because you would want to think that, that they still are even, even though they, they need to shift a bit. Um, once, you've, you know, once you've concluded that, you know, that that change needs to take place, then it's, you know, it's, it's very similar to the way you try to maintain your culture, but you have to articulate you know, what that change is you need to explain why the, why the change in culture is important to the success of the organization. Uh, and then you need to start modeling uh, those changes. And you can't model it in um, you know, one or two or three big significant events uh, to, to send the signal and then walk away and anticipate and expect that everybody's gonna um, you know, know what to do. It's really more uh, of a hundred or a thousand 
small opportunities to reflect what this new cultural, you know, what the new culture looks like, needs to look like, so that people can see it over and over and over again, and they too can begin to model it in time. Oh, that's good. I would say even if it, you're not trying to change it, just to sustain it, you need to be exactly. continually doing these small little things day in and day out. Um, because if you're not visibly doing things, um, employees tend to fill in the blanks um, and, uh, you know, kind of create their own narrative. So it's the constant, um, you know, just reinforcement of how you work together, how you make decisions, how you function in the lunchroom, in the hallway, in the parking lot. Um, at the beginning of every meeting, and you know, I, you, you do this, Mike. We see you, right, as yeah. a leader who is very intentional about everything you do. Yeah, I I love the idea of a bunch of little things because you can certainly do some large programs to help influence culture and change culture, but it's the little things done consistently that really make a difference. I also like the idea going back to the word around um, being intentional. Because I think if you're going to change a culture, you have to be intentional about not only what you want to change, but what you want to keep the same. And very rarely do you find an organization that has to start from scratch. Usually there are elements of the culture that are really important to the uh, ongoing success of the organization. And you want to be intentional about those aspects of the culture that you want to continue to nurture and develop over time, as well as be intentional about the areas that uh, that you want to change. But I really love the idea of doing a lot of things, small things consistently uh, to influence the, the change of an organization. As you were speaking, it made me think of the story you told the other day about some things about your culture that you want to keep, that you have to keep, right? This high touch customer experience in your branches, and yet now you're going to have to shift that a little bit because it's digital for in large part, right? That culture is really important to us and it's uh, part of who we are, why we've been successful, and it's uh, a big Im Im important part of who we will be going forward as well. Well, Mike, in, in your role, a, a newer role as, as CEO at, at Westfield Bank, um, maybe give people advice on what, what you're doing um, as, as you're coming in and adapting to the culture or, or how you approach the culture. I think you gave some some good advice on, on taking steps and, and being consistent, but is, is there anything else you, you, you tell our audience on? A big part is listening to the employees. Uh, so I think that's an, a really big element of um, anybody that's new to an organization, especially a new leader that is looking to uh, chart uh, I, perhaps a different direction or continue on the same journey as as a prior leader, it's important to understand what's important to the leader. So uh, listening is a very important part of um, change. Uh, and you can do that in a number of different ways, town halls, uh, suggestion boxes. Uh, you know, there are a lot of different ways to listen to the voice of the employee base. But regardless of how you do it, it's just important to do it. So be intentional about uh, listening to the voice of uh, the employees. Um, I think another activity that can help quite a bit is to engage the employees on their journey. So if there's a big initiative that is underway, uh, perhaps you're focusing on improving DEI. Um, while it's a great way to involve employees to help shape the direction of the organization as it relates to improving diversity, equity, and inclusion, or perhaps you have some other major initiatives that are underway within your organization. It's a very effective way to engage the employees to create employee groups so that their voice is being reflected in the work that's underway. So there are a lot of ways to get to it, Kevin, but uh, those are just a couple other ways to um, supplement the, uh, again, many small things that really helped shape the, the direction of an organization. Now, Mike, you brought up diversity and inclusion. How important is that to a company's culture? It, well, it's critical to a, to a company's culture because um, the data will prove that more diverse organizations are more successful organizations. And honestly, despite that, it's just the right thing to do for our communities. So I think it's a critical part of organizations and, and should be a part of their blueprint as they move forward. Um, when you have a more diverse organization, you also have uh, a more creative organization. 
So um, I think it's a critical element of who we are and uh, the, the like-minded organizations that we surround us with also have a similar focus around diversity, equity, and inclusion. No, that's great. I know there, there's always um, there's always that motto that floats around here. If, if you're all thinking the same, then no one's thinking at all, right? So I think that's important with, with diversity. It brings in different ideas and, and different ways to, to look at things. Exactly. So what do you, what do you think, uh, Beth, on uh, how important diversity, equity, inclusion is on, on a workplace culture? Yeah, well, I echo what Mike said. I mean, the data shows that the more thoughts and experiences you can bring to the table, the better the work will be. Um, the more innovative, um, and I think um, I think it's wonderful that our community is now demanding that we as businesses um, are intentional about adding diversity, um, about looking at uh, equitable policies and procedures, um, and then you know the DEI is evolving as well. There's a B now that's being added at the end, which is belonging. Uh, so it's a body of work, too, that I think is continually um, you know, changing in the marketplace for the good. It's expanding. It's getting more and more definition and attention. Um, and I, I think that's a really good thing for everyone. Good. Thank you. Mike, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, I, was, I was just reflecting. We have, a, we have a, a, a good friend who runs a DEI practice, and we were um, you know, talking about the, uh, the complexities of of introducing DEI as an initiative in organizations, and and she said something that really resonated with me. And and what she said was that um, there really isn't anything unique about what you need to do as leaders in an organization who's introducing DEI. She said DEI flourishes in organizations that have great cultures and great you know leaders. So she said it's really in in many respects it's back to the you know the fundamentals of what of what makes organizations strong and prosperous uh, are also going to be the same things that help a, a DEI initiative stick in an organization. I think is important, especially inside the walls of our organization, which is for all leaders to have an accountability to um, understand why it's important and to be accountable for the progress. So um, yeah, I would just add that one additional statement that. Um, the, the leadership accountability has to be there in order for the organization to truly embrace the, the focus and also recognize and appreciate all the value that comes out of being a more diverse organization. Good, thank you. Now, I, I almost hate saying this because I feel like we say this on every one of our podcasts, but we always bring up the pandemic or, or what, what impact has COVID had on, on a workplace or environment or culture? Uh, do you want to Comment on that? Um, I think we're really just beginning to see what that impact really is. And uh, I think it's going to continue to evolve for several years. We're going to see the outgrowth of this. Um, just take the, the one simple component of work from home and the, um, you know, the disparity there within one workplace and one culture where I get to stay home and somebody else doesn't. Uh, so I, I think that there's th there's a lot of nuances just from that one issue alone, and um, we're hearing from business leaders that that we work with that this is now all of a sudden kind of rising to the top again and really becoming a critical issue. Yeah, it's 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 interesting how we're we're kind of in a it feels like we're kind of in continuous whitewater of sorts. I mean, first we were trying to figure out how we survive as businesses in the middle of a pandemic and some of the technology that uh, actually enabled us to do that is now the same technology that is creating expectations on the part of you know employees you know across the nation uh, around their ability to work from home or work from the office or you know a mixture of the two um, and uh, of course you know some of the events that you know, that took place during the, uh, during the pandemic has, you know, created a, a, a sense of energy and urgency around uh, pulling DEI into organizations in a more significant way. So, um, you know, all that's been, you know, happening over the last two years has really uh, turned organizations kind of on their ear a little bit in terms of, of um, things, they need, things that leaders need to be thinking about and prepared to work on. Yeah. I think Culture is very important, and, and I think that the challenge is how do you maintain that? 
in, in some of the new environments we're working in. I mean, flexible comes to come to mind where people aren't always in the office on a regular basis, but how do you, how do you still maintain that culture working digitally or, or you know, like keeping in touch with each other electronically as, as part of it? Like, do you wanna give some? Sure. some... There is so much value created uh, just walking down a hall and bumping into somebody or you know, finding somebody next to the coffee machine and having an informal conversation. And that doesn't happen when you have a workforce that's working from home. So there are clearly some challenges associated with working in a, an extended work uh, or remote environment. Um, and I don't wanna downplay all the disruption that the pandemic has created, because it certainly has created a lot of uh, disruption for organizations and for our community. But there's also been a lot of good that has um, surfaced because of the pandemic. Um, many companies have become much more agile. Uh, many of our employees and our leaders have become better adopters of technology. So there has been some efficiency that has been created along the way. And ultimately that benefits the users of our products or our services. Um, so there is, there is good that can be recognized from what the pandemic created for companies like ours. Uh, and I think leaders um, who are progressively thinking about the success of their organizations are gonna think about how they leverage the good stuff and do more with the good stuff. So it's something, it's an area of opportunity. Um, out of every good crisis comes a greater opportunity. Um, and I, I think the pandemic is a great example of that. Um, it is requiring us to think about leadership differently. So uh, many years ago, when I first started in, uh, in my career, I'll just give you two examples. I never had to run a hybrid meeting where I had some of the audience that was there in person and some of the audience that was participating uh, remotely. Those, it's a different skill set to uh, navigate that kind of meeting. The other thing that's a little bit different from when I started my career was back in the early 90s and the late 80s, if you weren't feeling well, well, you still showed up to work. And that is an old, outdated mindset these days. We have a responsibility to protect our team members. And uh, uh, so it, it requires us to think differently as leaders and maybe uh, subscribe to, to a different mindset of leadership to uh, change some of the fundamentals of what we were taught early in our careers. I would agree with that. And as you were talking, I was thinking of a couple um, other examples where as leaders, we're going to have to do things totally differently. So you know, how, how do you um, promote and develop someone that you rarely see versus promoting and developing people that you see all the time? And so walking that fine line is going to be a, a challenge, I think, for leaders going forward. And the other thing that we're hearing a lot um, from you know, CEOs and business owners that we work with is that there, there's an emotional component that hasn't been dealt with yet. And that is, you know, I've got this family culture and now my family members don't want to come back. And that hurts. And that, that whole piece of it, um, I think we're, we're just beginning to see um, leaders themselves struggle uh, with their own emotional reactions to, to what's happening. Yeah, I, I saw a news piece not too long ago about teaching in that hybrid environment and the teacher um, referred he had his zoomies and his roomies <laughs> and and it was you know it was I, I thought it was interesting and kind of cute but at the same time it occurred to me okay uh, the people who are not in the classroom are getting a label that's different than the label that's being applied to the kids who are in the classroom and I think um, we see that in the workplace as well. And to Beth's point, how, you, how do you make sure as a leader that you um, are able to recognize and acknowledge and reward um, great work that's being done by people who you don't see every day just in the same way that you do those who are there all the time? You, you know, when Flexible work first started coming out, it was, it was, it's been around for a while, but really became pr predominant in, around the pandemic. But it really was, people looked at it as, as a way to, for work-life balance. Um, but I'm not sure it's, it's there as much as it used to be because we made people so flexible and, and able to do their job at home. 
that their hours sometimes may get extended. So how do you manage through that? How do you, how do you manage through that so you don't burn out your, your employees? Yeah, I think that's a real question, Kevin, and a difficult answer to, um, to provide. But um, it, it is a, a big issue. Uh, the reality is that uh, we've made it so convenient to, for people to never turn it off. <laughs> but again, going back to this discussion about how do we as leaders need to lead differently and how do we need to model the right behaviors, I think it starts with us. Um, you know, one of the tools that we've talked about among our executive team, uh, and, and you're a big proponent of, of it, Kevin, is um, if we are working on the weekend and we're typing an email or making a request, um, it doesn't mean that we should expect all of our staff members to respond right away. And one way or one tool to help um, promote that philosophy is to schedule the delivery of your email messages so that it goes out Monday morning instead of a Sunday morning. So it's important that all employees, all staff members have an opportunity to decompress. That's how you recharge and come back on Monday um, ready to go. But if you never, if you're constantly uh, depleting the battery, you're not going to be giving your best on a Monday. And we have a responsibility to help our team members find the right balance and make sure that they're coming to the, uh, to the office fully charged and ready to go. So that's a good point. Much like culture, it's driven from the top and, and has to be reinforced that way. Is there, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Setting boundaries and um, not having you know scope creep um, is different for every person. And now more than ever, it's important to person by person to ask, you know, how are you doing? And what can I do for you? And how is this working out for you? How is this fitting with your family? And that we are going to have to be creative in, in managing a lot of different scenarios so that we're meeting the needs of all the employees, but it's not one solution. It's, it's kind of around, uh, also there's a lot of you know, uh, discussion around uh, physical and mental well-being uh, as a critical component for employee engagement, employee empowerment, success within the organization. And I think it ties back to what you're talking about, Mike um, and Beth. You know, when people are working from home, um, the flexibility is there for them to um, step away, get something done that needs to be done, step back. But you're right, the kind of the black and the white of at work, not at work kind of all goes to gray. And, um, you know, you can't always dictate or you can't always be aware of everything that's going on, um, you know, at work when the person's working from home. But what you can do is try to make sure that you put steps in place to ensure that, um, that they're remaining physically and emotionally healthy uh, while they're going about doing it. And um, if not, you try to address that. If I could just follow up on that, I think that's a great point, Mike, and um, more important than ever. Uh, but I also wanted to double click on something that Beth had mentioned because you were talking about recognizing that there's not a one size fits all uh, solution to every problem that we're trying to solve. And to me, that's the fundamental philosophy around being equitable is recognizing that not everybody has the same situation. And um, as we think about working from home, there are some people that some of our workforce uh, has young kids and that presents different challenges, especially in a pandemic period versus somebody who's maybe uh, kids are grown and, and are out of the, the house and the house is quiet. Um, some people have better access to high speed internet than, than others, but all these issues have to be uh, considered when we think about how do we best support our employees to develop that culture, that workplace culture that uh, is so important to us. So but I, I think it's a great comment, Beth, and, and I really appreciate you mentioning that. It's kind of the B and the DEI and B, the belonging piece. So as an organization, you can do things to include me. So the inclusivity is kind of incumbent upon you, but is it working for me? Do I feel like I belong? Because not everything that the organization does hits me. So it's kind of that, it's that same piece. Um, and yeah, I agree with you, it's really important. Well, developing employees is, is important to build um, on, on culture. And like you mentioned, empowering employees. So how important is empowering employees um, towards that development process? Well, it's just, it's, 
it's equally as powerful uh, and equally as important as maintaining the right culture and uh, taking steps to make sure that you have an engaged employee population. Uh, because if I, uh, you know, if I as an employee feel that I have and know that I have the ability and the responsibility to make certain decisions and take certain actions without checking in with somebody, um, and I know that um, I know that I'm operating in a safe environment, recognizing that I'm not always going to make the right decision, but um, that in those occasional those occasions when I don't, uh, I'm going to be supported rather than criticized. Then my my ability to do the right thing and do it consistently, you know, jumps tremendously compared to a situation where I'm always worried about. Am I doing the right thing? Am I going to get in trouble if I do this? Am I going to get in trouble if I do it wrong? Uh, so to me, that's, that's really the crux of, of what empowerment is all about. Okay. Beth, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, earlier on we talked about you know, uh, being very intentional. Um, and I think this is really adding consistency to that piece. Mm -hmm. So when you know a, a team knows that you are always showing up the same way, that they're you know that your response is going to be the same. You're not the Jekyll and Hyde leader. Um, they feel emotional safety and their ability to take risks and innovate and make decisions um, just skyrockets when they feel that emotional uh, safety. So I think being a consistent leader. Um, and managing yourself is, is really important, um, particularly as the stress levels go up. Thank you. Mike, what have you seen or, or, or done just to enhance empowerment uh, within an organization? Yeah, so um, I would agree that empowerment is absolutely critical. To me, empowering employees enables you to really grow and develop your team, which ultimately become your leaders of the future. So it's important to empower them. I will tell you that uh, empowerment feels harder than ever for me right now. And I'll give you two reasons why. One is because I'm a new to role leader, uh, being new to the CEO role at uh, Westfield Bank. Um, so I recognize that as a CEO of an organization, I'm accountable for everything that happens. So for me uh, to promote empowerment, it means that I'm um, less in control of the outcome. And when you're a new leader, that, that's really, really hard. But again, if you're intentional about it, you can overcome that. The other thing that is makes it harder for me right now, and I suspect uh, it's harder for a lot of people that will be watching this episode, is that when you're working remotely and you empower people, you have less opportunity to oversee the progress because you're not there in front of them as frequently. So if you are sitting next to somebody in, in an office or a cubicle next door and you empower somebody, you have an opportunity along the way to check in, like, how's it going? And if you don't like the direction or if you maybe think there's a different direction that could be, be pursued, you have an opportunity to in, intervene quicker. But when you're empowering somebody and you're working with somebody who you may not see as frequently, uh, it's harder to have those regular progress check-ins. So it's, it, it's just a harder leadership issue to um, address when you're continuing to promote empowerment and enable the employee base, but yet you don't have as many opportunities to check in and monitor progress and um, uh, provide help along the way. Well, if you're, if you're an organization, you wanna grow, you have to empower people to help you grow because you just can't do everything yourself. You mentioned um, about being a new leader. So I'm going to throw this, this right back at you, Mike, is, is how important is leadership training to an organization to develop employees or even the culture? For me, I think it's critical. It's really critical to the ongoing success of the organization. And we've been fortunate that we've been able to partner with uh, Mike and Beth and team at Ratliff and Taylor to help identify the leadership attributes that are important to our organization on a long-term basis, and then to uh, assess where we are relative to uh, that leadership model and then develop a program to basically fill in the gaps. So I think it's absolutely critical to the ongoing success of the organization, but it requires an agile approach, especially as we think about 
this pandemic and how we need to lead differently going forward. So uh, again, I, if companies aren't doing this, I think it's important to be very purposeful and intentional about thinking about uh, leadership, leadership skills, and assessing if you have the right skills in place right now to be able to drive the success of the organization going forward. No, that's great. Thank you, Mike. Mike or Beth, what about your thoughts on, on leadership training and, and the importance to uh, an organization and its culture? Well, um, this is a huge piece of our body of work, so obviously we're um, big proponents. Um, but I, th I think a trend that we're seeing right now is um, well, twofold. One, um, organizations needing to provide the leadership uh, development to leaders as people first. Um, they've got to start taking care of themselves during this. Um, so there's kind of a, a, a dual uh, focus there. And so how can they as leaders take care of themselves, their peer group, um, and then begin to um, you know, develop their teams further and, and, and be stronger and more productive. Um, you know, the, the second piece that we're seeing is that um, companies trying to attract talent and retain talent, um, development is one of the key components. So are you putting dollars into your leaders, into your teams, into people across the organization and not just at the top? Um, so I think that that's a new trend that we're seeing. I think <clears throat> another thing that I've noticed in the last, particularly in the last few years also is, is kind of back to the one size doesn't fit all approach. Um, you know, we, we feel that we're a lot more effective in helping build leadership development programs for organizations if we can sit down with them first and have them articulate uh, what, type, what type of leadership outcomes they want to see in the people we're, we're going to be working with. So I think that's another trend that we're starting to see is the importance of tailoring uh, leadership programs to the, to the wants and needs and outcomes that, um, you know, that each client is looking for in their organization. Are leaders born or can they be made? You, know, you often hear you can't teach people how to lead. You can teach people how to lead. I think that's key for, for many organizations out there to just maybe have that as a, as a, as a takeaway. Well, even sub, you know, some categories within leadership development, people will often ask, um, executive presence, can you teach that? Um, or do people just kind of have that gravitas? And no, you can teach it. If I can add one thought there, because I completely agree. I also believe that it requires somebody who's willing to learn. So you can teach it, but if they have no interest or desire to learn, it's going to be very, very difficult. Yeah, leadership, leadership development is always um, most effective when it's a two-way street. And, um, and certainly there are you know, individuals who just instinctively display certain behaviors that you associate with different leadership capabilities. Um, and they may, be do, they may be displaying those intentionally or you know, unintentionally, uh, but everyone has the ability to uh, improve and dramatically so if they're, if they're truly interested in wanting to, you know, wanting to learn and have that, they have that learning mindset as they go into the experience. I've always been one that views training and development as a, an investment. It's an investment that a company makes in the ongoing success of an individual or a team. I'm curious uh, your perspective as you think about companies identifying individuals to invest in. Is it appropriate to have, for a leader to have a conversation with an employee up front that sounds something like to the effect that I want to make an investment in your growth and your development, but it is a two-way two street and it requires you to be fully uh, committed to the learning and development as well. Are you ready for us to make that investment in you? Is that an appropriate conversation to have with somebody before you sign somebody up to go to a, a learning and development experience. I, I think it's I, I think it's extremely important, um, and and particularly so in organizations that um, are you know show a lot of transparency about how they how they operate and how leaders lead, um, and um, to me it's you know that's that's the very one of the very first steps in placing. Um, 
you know, confidence in and, and, and establishing some credibility with that person, letting them know um, that you're genuinely interested in their growth. Um, but, but, you know, asking them, are you, are you prepared to do that? So making that commitment, um, I, I think, is a critical first step. And, and in our, actually, our coaching work, it's one of the very first things that we do is make sure everyone around the table is aware of the commitments um, and the accountability, and that includes the individual being coached uh, and developed. And, you know, keeping commitments is a huge piece of leadership, so, yes. Well, we covered a lot of topics today. Um, I want to ask one more question to each of you uh, be before we end. So think back in your experiences through your whole work life, and what, what I, I guess, what advice would you give somebody on leadership? Mike, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, boy, I've been fortunate because I've had so many guides over the course of my career that have provided me with um, input and perspectives that have shaped who I am as a leader. So it's hard to just isolate one. But if I was going to think about one piece of advice that I think of today on a regular basis, that's to be purposeful and intentional about what I do. And as we advance in our career, uh, it becomes less about how much you do and more about the impact of any one thing you do. So I try to think of each day what I'm going to be purposeful and intentional about and being great at so that I can make the biggest contribution possible that day. No, that's great. Thanks, Mike. Beth, what about you? What advice would you give our listeners? Um, well, I have a quote on my bio that says, go where you're celebrated. And, you know, for me, that means, you know, if you're around people who um, align with you in terms of beliefs and value system, um, you can have fun, you can feel great about the work that you're doing. Um, and so to be in a group of people, and I fortunately am, you know, where I can be celebrated, my life can be celebrated, my work can be celebrated, I think brings the best me to the table. Okay, thank you. Mike? Uh, early on in my career, I had a, I had a boss who um, one day sat down and told me, um, he said, his, his words were, um, I, I don't want, you know, I, I want to be able to evaluate you based upon the quality of the decisions you make. I don't want to evaluate you based upon how effectively you carry out my decisions. And that piece of advice just really struck me and has stuck with me my entire career. You know, I, I recognize now looking back on it, um, empowerment I don't think was a word, at least not thrown around in corporations at that time, but that was a very empowering statement. Uh, it was also, I think, uh, a great reflection of his leadership because he was more about, you know, watching me and helping me grow as a professional, as a leader, than he was uh, getting his work done. So that's you know an approach or a, a, a way I would encourage people to, to to think about working with people in their organizations. Good, thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. We covered a lot of topics around workplace culture and, and employee development, but I always ask our guests one question um, out there, and it's what's on your watch list. So this is your opportunity to just kind of talk what, what's important to you or top of mind to you. So. Beth, we'll start with you. So what's on your watch list? I am re-watching uh, Ted Lasso with a leadership lens. Um, and so thinking about a leader who approaches everything with kindness and humor um, and communication um, and teamwork, I, I'm kind of re-watching the series with that lens. So that's my watch oh, list. Right. A way to get leadership training and entertainment all in one. So good. Mike, what about you? You know, I've over the last 12 months, I've been reading um, a lot of white papers and articles published by uh, Harvard Business Review, and it's it's all around this new world of work, and what it's going to look like, and how organizations are going to be impacted by it, and what leaders need to do to maintain culture in this new world of work. So, I would encourage anybody who has the opportunity uh, to hop out to. Uh, uh, to Harvard Business Review and just read a few of those articles. They're really good. Good. Thank you, Mike. And Mike Toth, what about you? What's on your watch list? I guess if I was going to offer up one um, 
thing to put on everybody's watch list. It's uh, honestly, I would put the Ratliff and, and Taylor team on your watch list. They're doing a lot of great things. I very much appreciate everything that you're doing to help our organization. But I know that you offer so many resources available online and webinars and a lot of them at no cost. And I appreciate what you're doing for not only the bank, but for the community as a whole with all of that outreach. So thank you. So I would put their website and their podcasts on your watch list. And, and that's a good point. I mean, developing culture and developing employees and, and helping along leadership is a, is, a, is a tough hill to climb. And sometimes you need outside help to do that. So that's, that's important to, to know when you do need help. So. Well, thank you all for joining us here today. It was some good topics we covered. And, and again, thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks. Sharing Knowledge is brought to you by Westfield Bank, hosted by Kevin Vondro, Chief Lending Officer. From the imagination and creativity of Chris Van Osdale, Elise Love, Suzanne Favory, Corinne Wilson, Kartika M. Caffey, the marketing and communications strategist at Westfield Bank. Produced, edited, and mixed by Shark and Minnow. Learn more at westfield-bank.com forward slash SKS. Sharing knowledge and shedding light on the financial industry to empower financial freedom. The Sharing Knowledge series of videos, podcast episodes, and articles are for informational purposes only and is not intended to serve as legal, tax, financial investment, accounting, or regulatory advice. Opinions expressed and third-party information shared herein do not reflect the opinions of Westfield Bank, Westfield Group, or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. The information shared does not constitute nor is intended as an offer or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any product or service. Testimonials may not be representative of the experience of other customers and are not guarantees of future performance or success. Bank products and services provided by Westfield Bank, member FDIC, an equal opportunity lender.